thing here in this room is a will. Hello and welcome back to another episode of the Mystery Vault Podcast. I'm your host, RJ McCready, and for this episode, we're going to be taking a look at the Dyatlov Pass instant. Um, now, some of you might know it, some of you might not. That's what I'm here for today, is to try and whet your appetite on this subject, and you might go away and think, actually, I want to look into this a little bit more. So the object of the show, as always, guys, if you listen to the other episodes, is just to give you a 30-minute rundown of a mystery. I'll give you some facts. Um... I'll give you what people think has happened, and then I'll tell you what I, I think has happened. But with this one, um, <laughs> it kind of led me down a rabbit hole, because I was supposed to record this the other day, and then I looked at my notes and I thought there's probably a little bit more that I could possibly gather. Um, but the important thing to mention here is this is a rundown. Um, I could be here for hours if I really got into this, so it's just going to be a bit of an overview just to... Uh, give you an insight um, to what this in, uh, this mystery is all about. So um, I can't put enough emphasis on uh, the fact that this subject has been uh, looked at with a fine uh, comb and there's lots of books, there's lots of documentaries, there's lots of other shows that talk about it. Uh, there's uh, people out there have devoted their lives to investigating this case, so you know respect to them. So um, I thought I'd just do that first as a little bit of a little bit of admin for the start of the show. Let's get into this. Let's give you a quick synopsis. Uh, so the Dyatlov Pass incident was an event which nine Russian hikers died in northern Ural Mountains between the first and second of February 1959. During the night, something caused them to cut out their tent and flee the campsite whilst inadequately dressed for heavy snowfall and sub-zero temperatures. So the Dyatlov Pass is actually named after the camp's leader, which is Igor Dyatlov. Um, He's assembled a group of other nine members for a skiing expedition across the northern Urals, which is in Russia, but back then, in 1959, this was part of the Soviet Union up until 1991. And these guys were aged between 20 and 23 years old. They were young university students. And being in the Soviet Union back then, you weren't allowed to travel to other countries. You had to stay within the Soviet Union. So for them to go on an adventure, that to, that to stay with within those boundaries and they decided to go to this pass um, but originally this location is called the Kailat Zykel I, I think that's how you pronounce it um, it's known by the local Manzai tribe which I'll get into later on as a dead mountain now that sounds very spooky the dead mountain but from the local tribe it just basically means it's barren there's nothing going on there and it's not a um, sacred place at all from the tribe um, they basically said that after this incident after the investigation that uh, the reason why we call it dead mountain there's nothing there there's nothing sacred about it it's just a, a mountain pass um, which is one of the theories which I'll get into later on uh, it's actually located between Eastern Europe and West Siberia um, and as I said it was the Soviet Union but now is now Russia um, getting back to Dyatlov, a uh, 23-year-old radio engineer, uh, pretty switched-on guy. Uh, he belonged to the Ural Polytechnic Institute, which is now a university. And it's important to note here that each member of the group was very experienced. They were grade 2 hikers, and the actual purpose of this expedition was to actually achieve a grade 3 qualification. Uh, which is a total of 190 miles, 300 kilometers of, of climbing to achieve that. So these guys were dedicated f uh, to this. They wanted to achieve it. Um, so 
seemed like I switched on a bunch, bunch of people that knew what they do. So this is important to, to mention. They weren't just a group of guys who just thought, let's just go and let's just go into the mountains, get some uh, camp stuff and let's see how it goes. These guys were, were switched on. Um, and the object of the route uh, by Dyatlov was to reach the north regions of the Ural Mountains. So the time frame for this expedition was between January the 25th when they started out and it was to finish on February the 12th where Dyatlov agreed to send a, a radio message or a telegram back to his uh, relatives or the university to say hey I've made it so that just gives you a rough time frame there. Uh, the other thing that's the other thing here to mention, um, like I say, this is all like the building block here, because it's actually approved by the Physical Culture Sports Committee. Um, so again, can't emphasise this enough. This was a very well-planned um, expedition. Nothing, there was no cut, corners cut here at all um, with the planning. So it was approved. Everybody was level two. Everybody seemed to know what they're doing. They're very well equipped. Camp, camping equipment, food supplies. Um, and they they set out a route and had a plan and there was a beginning and there was an end so on the 25th of january 1959 the group arrived by train uh, in the early hours um, they equipped themselves with bread which uh, gives you some high energy levels for for climbing and the other thing to mention here the group initially started off as as 10 uh, so it was made up of uh, two females and eight men but at the start of the expedition there was a guy called Yuri Yudin who had to turn back because his knee joint was playing him up and he couldn't continue so he was the only survivor of the group who um, helped out with the investigation just to give you give them a rough sort of theorise of what possibly went on which I'll get into later on the group also had a diary, so they're just keeping the log of what they were doing, and they were also assisted by cameras. I think just one of the group members had a um, camera. And then on the 30th of January, the group arrived at the edge of the Highland area, which is a wooded area surrounded by trees uh, covering them from, from weather, and this was the foot of the pass of the Colat cycle. Um, they made a log that the, the, the weather was worsening, but they still continued. Uh, the 1st of February, now this is getting close to where they, the incidents happened. Um, they climbed the pass. Uh, again, they say that the, the weather is starting to worsen. Um, they start to lose visibility. Uh, so they decide to camp on the slope of the mountain rather than go back 1.5 kilometres to the wooded area, which would, would make sense um, to give them some cover from the weather um, but this is where I mentioned the Yuri Yurdin guy who left the camp later on when he when they speak to him they they think that the reason why Dyatlov didn't go back 1.5 kilometers purely was not to lose that time or that distance so he decided to um, camp in these conditions and also uh, as an experience for them to think hey Let's, let's camp here in these conditions. Let's see if we can do it. Let's see if we can camp on a mountain pass. So that's one of the theories from Yuri Yudin uh, who helped with the investigation. So with the, the diary, this is what we know so far that they camped and this is where the incident happens. Um, move, just moving on a bit, um, we get to the 20th of February. So this is days after the 12th of Jan or the 12th of February when the group was, was supposed to send a uh, telegram and relatives, um, family, fellow students, teachers became concerned. Uh, by the 20th of February they demanded that there was um, a search and rescue. Uh, they decided to take it upon themselves to go out and look for them, which is um, uh, the volunteer students and teachers from the university. Later, the army became involved with planes and helicopters, so they ramped it up a little bit. And then on the 26th of February, searchers found the group's badly damaged camp. And now this is where this 
this this case becomes interesting. So they find the one tent which the um, group used. And what's strange here is the tent is upright and the zip access to get in and out of the tent is, is fastened. It's fastened closed. And inside the camp, if this is where that... Well, I've mentioned before, and this is why I do these other episodes, is, to, <laughs> is that phrase, it's like the Mary Celeste. This, this, this is what's weird about this, is that the tent itself is all set up with belongings, valuables, um, the bed's all tidy, everything looks in, in uniform condition, even the stove had some food on it. But there's a rip in the tent, as if they've ripped the tent to escape and get out. And there's footprints which the um, search and rescue teams follow. And what's strange about the footprints now is that they don't look like they've been made with, with shoes. They just look like they've been made with bare feet. And when they finally find the two uh, bodies, um, 1.5 kilometers away from the camp, which is um, down towards where the, the tree line was, where they were supposed to, where they should have camped, um, just on the outer edge of this tree line, they find two bodies dressed only in underwear with no shoes on. Um, but what they do find is the remains of a small campfire, so it's as if they tried to light a fire. And the other strange thing here, here is where just below, where, where the bodies are found, there's a tree and it looks like the branches have been torn off going up about five meters. So it's like one of them has tried to climb up the tree. And then 630 meters from this tree line, they find three other camp members, uh, which is actually Dyatlov himself. Um, I think they're a little bit better clothed, but again, they've got shoes missing. Um, but it's not until two months later where they find the remaining four other bodies. Um, now, this time, the snow has melted, and they were found at the bottom of a, a ravine. Only 75 metres from the edge of the camp where they found the campfire and the two other survivors. Um, but they were covered in 13 foot of snow, but this was melting snow. Um, so yes, so, so, all this, so in this case, when you look at other mysteries, it's not like these guys have gone into the mountain pass and just disappeared. They have actually all been found, um, but found with mysterious circumstances. So... Um, the other thing I need to mention here as well is that not only did the army get involved in 1959, what really whets people's appetite with this case, which I've, what I've looked at, is that the KGB actually got involved. Um, so they looked at it as, as, a, as a crime scene, which is fair, so you want to have a look into it, you know. Um, nine people have died in possible mysterious circumstances so I understand that but what's the strange the strange thing here is is that this in this time the KGB have come in they've taken all the bodies taken all the evidence taken all the cameras and they've told everybody who's part of the search team they said look we've investigated it we can't see that there's any evidence of a crime we think there is a it's just an accident and They've put everything into a KGB file, big old red stamp on it, and this red red stamp says classified. And the only thing that they say to the people when they say, well, what is it? They just say it, it's just a compelling, they died because of a compelling natural force, and that's it. <laughs> so you think to yourself, well, right, compelling natural force, so what, what's that? That could be lots of different things. So, um, this is why people have gone, okay, KGB got involved, they put classified on it, they've taken all, all the evidence away and they've put it into a filing cabinet for no one else to see. Um, obviously this was under the Soviet Union as well um, and it wasn't until 1991 when the Soviet Union collapsed 
that these files were released to the public for everybody to see so then people could start to see the autopsy reports and the photos from the camera funny enough and they could look into this so it's been the last 30 years that people have had managed to get hold of this um, evidence and have a look at it and start to think right okay what's happened with what is what happened at the dial of pass but obviously um in the mystery world there's there's lots of speculation people have looked at things like ufos i've mentioned this so many times aliens get involved um because on one of the Photos, there was actually um, a photo taken of some weird lights. Um, but take of that what you will, because some people say, oh, well, it could be just a camp stove or, or a match or something like that. But there was, there was a photograph of some um, strange lights, which you can see on Google. Uh, the Yeti has been mentioned as well. Um, of course it will be. You know, it's snow, it's mountains. The Mansai people, the indigenous tribe, um, actually tell tales of the... Uh, the yeti type creature but in this region they say that he's not a he's not a particularly nice uh creature he, he's quite vicious um so that gets people's mind thinking and i think that's one of the biggest things for this case is that that's 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 the big one people think they were attacked by a yeti because of the um slash marks on on the tent now I mentioned the Mansai tribe; they were investigated as well. But um, they, we've one well, also need to mention is they also helped with the rescue team. Um, so three of them were investigated, but that was that was quickly boshed because uh, the evidence here is in the snow. They couldn't find any other print footprints around the campsite except the the nine. Um, victims um so they boshed that one um and talking of the victims here uh nine of no six of them had it was said on record that they died of hypothermia three of them this is where it gets strange um three of them they say it was almost like they were hit by a train that their bodies suffered some sort of uh, impact trauma um one of them had a fractured skull and this is where it gets a little bit um, gory and strange is that I think it's one or two of them had their eyes missing and one of the females uh, now this was the group that were found on the ravine um, she had a tongue missing eyes, eyes ball, eyeballs were, were missing and um, her heart had exploded but there are some explanations for that which I'll get into in a minute but on you know when you talk about this and as, as I said before you know with, with mysteries if I if I just said, you know, this cat, this group went missing, they got found, they got found in three, di three different places, different groups. Um, one of them got found with no clothes on, you know, fractured skulls, eyes missing, tongue missing, mysterious. So you can see how this, this case can become, uh, like I say, wet people's appetites. Go, oh, wow, this is, this is, you know, this is mysterious, this is crazy. So I can sort of get that. The case is, is strange. And you can sort of see how people can sort of lead into, oh, it could be this, it could be a Yeti, you know. It could have been like an axe murderer that turned up from one of the local prisons, which is one of the plausible cases. Um, but that was ruled out because they couldn't find any other footprints. Um, like I say, you've got the strange lights. The other strange thing as well was that they found some radioactive substances on the clothing but again that got ruled out because two of the students worked in a a lab where they were working with radiation but again you can sort of see how that can ramp this case up a little bit but um every time they do get they do find something they do come to a conclusion with it but then it does lead on to another scratch head moment oh how did this happen um But um, in 2019, quite recently, just before we had um, the uh, mentioned now the COVID-19 uh, pandemic, Russia did open this case up to say once and for all, let's have a look into this, let's work out, uh, let's get a final conclusion on this. And they did look into it, and their conclusion was that it was an avalanche, um, and they called it a slab out of avalanche. So it's the way that the tent was pitched. And then a slab of snow came down and went over the tent, which could have caused them to panic and then try and get out of the tent. 
Um, which is why they only had sort of minimal clothing on. But uh, this kind of gets debunked by fellow um, theorists by saying, well, if it was an avalanche, how come, how come the tent isn't covered in 30 foot snow? And how come the tent was was upright? Um, and then how come the survivors weren't dragged down the mountain with the snow? And why have you got footprints? So uh, it's I can see why people f- may think it's an avalanche, but you've you've got the footprints in in the snow. Um, so it's 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 a very loose theory for me. Uh, the other theory is um, the local Mansai tribe. Now they had uh, uh, ma- magic mushrooms, uh, which was one of their one of their practices. Uh, some people said that the group um, tried this and it caused like uh, hallucinations and hallucinations, which were so fear that they just lost their minds, uh, started seeing things and decided to run out of the camp naked, slash the tent because of one of the hallucinations and then just run out into the snow and just get into trouble and obviously suffer hypothermia which is kind of possibly plausible but then um, when you look at the building block of this group they seem like they're a dedicated group of uh, young people who want to achieve this level three in hiking they've put a lot into it and i don't think and this is the opinions of other people that i've when i've done the research people said that surely that they're 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 that dedicated that they wouldn't do that not at this time whilst in the middle of the snow where the weather's 40 degrees um below and it's snowing outside, so I, I would rule that one out. But again, you know, it's another it's another plausible theory. Um, now this one, the theory that I do like, um, is the theory of uh, mini tornadoes that occur in, in the wilderness in in the mountains. Now, um, you hear the phrase that you know the wind blows that hard it makes a high pitched noise so what they're saying is that there was uh, the wind was blowing that much that it created a frequency and I think this has been tested as well with um, you know advanced weapon technology where you can use a high pitched sound that will go through you you won't necessarily hear it but it could cause you to go crazy and hallucinate And this is one of the theories which I do like, which kind of makes it plausible that this happened to the camps group. There was a high-pitched noise that went through the the camp members. It caused them to to go um, crazy with hallucinations and make them, you know, rip out the tent and run away. Um, Plausible, uh, possible. And then Going back to the Yeti theory, now this is uh, worth highlighting. So when, um, after 1991, you had access to the camera footage, there is actually a photograph of what people think is a Yeti. It's a black and white photo. Go and check it out on on, on Google. It does look a bit. It does look a bit creepy. Um, it's a bit like the Yeti photograph. Um, which, uh, which is the famous one, which I, which, well, not the Yeti, the Bigfoot photograph, uh, which I've spoken about. Um, and yeah, I, it, some people say it is, some people say it's just one of the camp members in the distance. So um, have a look at it, make your own mind up about that. I think as a roundup, so there you go, guys, giving you some of the facts of the case here. That is basically the Dialatov. Um, past instant as as a roundup something mysterious has happened here the Russians after investigating into 2019 are saying it's an avalanche um, I've said that the KGB have got involved at the beginning and classed this as a classified case so you can see why people think oh that's a bit strange um, but I think at that time in the 1950, back in 1959, it was, 
Russia still keeps themselves to themselves. Uh, that's not un unusual. So maybe just the KGB just wanted to keep this case to themselves. And, um, so you can look at that at, as, as, as you want. Um, but yeah, I, there's some of the stuff there, guys. You can make your own mind up about it. Well, I've, it's, uh, it is an unusual one. But as I said before, you know, you, um, one one question leads to another, and as soon as you get it into your head, you think it must have been an avalanche. You know, it, that seems plausible. But then you start thinking, well, how come the tent wasn't totally demolished and covered in snow? How come it was still upright? And surely, if it was an avalanche, the guys would still be in the tent, possibly just covered in snow. Uh, I think if it was that, I think you probably just be able to wrap this up but the fact that the tent is still upright it's been slashed um and then camp members have you know walked out with no clothes on 1.5 kilometers away um that's a long distance to travel with no shoes on um you start questioning all the other stuff so you can see how this can branch off into i think it's a total of 75 different theories which um I won't get into now because I'd like to say I'd be here for hours of it, but um, that is a that is a rundown of of this case. So hopefully, um, you guys listening to this uh, will go away and know a little bit more about it. And it may be it might just whet your appetite just to sort of go onto Google and have a look at it and have a look at all the other stuff. But like I say, um, uh, there are to be fair uh, in this case, I do know there's a lot of people that have dedicated um, a lot of time into this case. Um, with books and documentaries um so yeah i i think it's gonna i don't know whether we'll ever have a final conclusion i don't think so um it will be with all the other mysteries uh in the mystery book um with all the other sh uh, shows i've done so far um so there you go guys uh oh and just before this is quite important as well before I wrap up the show. There is actually a monument in Russia which dedicates the, the nine victims. And it, it, all, I, all I want to say is, you know, it must have been awful whatever happened. Um, and it's a very, very sad story to think that, you know, these nine university students went out uh, to go and get their level three and something awful happened. Uh, which is very sad. So, you know, dedication to them um, for for the episode. Um, and hopefully one day we will, we will get the answer. Uh, and there's also a museum uh, at the, I think it's at the Ural Mountains where the university is initially. So I think there's a, u a university which is also dedicated to them as well. Um, so yes, uh, so there you go, guys. Hopefully, hope you um, enjoyed that episode. Um Let's do a little bit of admin for the show before I wrap it up. So I am a proud member of the Legion Podcast Network. So please go and check out uh, my other show, which is Bite Size Cinema Podcast. I just dropped a new episode uh, with guest Gary Hill from Cinema Beef Podcast, where we look at the 1989 movie Roadhouse with Patrick Swayze. Uh, so go and check that out. All well, my other um, episodes on there. Um, you can find the Mystery Vault podcast on Spotify, iTunes, uh, YouTube, and several other players uh, if you put it into Google. I've got a Facebook page, which is where I'm most active. Uh, it's the best place to contact me if there's any um, mystery suggestions, something you want me to have a look at. I'd be happy to do that. Um, whilst I'm talking about that, I'll talk about my next episode. So... I'm just going to do something a little bit sort of biblical for the next one. Uh, do do these items exist, which is something I'm interested in. And I'm going to be looking at uh, Noah's Ark. Um, I had a little look at that the other day, and apparently people say that they found it up in the mountains. Um, so I think that'd be a good one to talk about. And uh, yeah, we'll see where that goes. So look out for that. That'll be the next episode. Um, so yes, uh, as always, guys... Keep it mysterious, keep it safe, and I'll see you soon. I think this is a ghost story. I think this is a ghost story. I think this is a ghost story. Ghost, ghost, ghost story. Because one of you, sitting here in this room, is a whale.
If you enjoyed this show, then make sure you check out the other great shows on the Legion Podcast Network, like Cinema PsyOps, Cinema Beef, Devour the Podcast, Duncan and Bo Come Correct, Exploding Heads Horror Movie Podcast, Friday the 13th, Get Slayed, The Hell Ming Power Hour, Hello, This is the Doom Show, Hero Hero Ghost Show, Kill the Cast, Underwater Kaiju from Outer Space, Jerry Hates Action, Legion After Dark, Metal Health, Obsessive Cinema, Discourse, Pick Six Movies, The Podcast by the Cemetery, The Podcast on Haunted Hill, The Psycho Semantic Podcast, Rick Radio, House of Wax, Dude Looks Like the 80s, Rabbit and Red Radio, The Shade Cast, Short Bus Cinema, Two Drink Minimum Commentaries, The VD Clinic, Who Will Survive Horror Podcast, and Which vs. the Doomsday Clock. With such a widespread of shows, there is guaranteed to be a niche for you to fall in love with. Horror, politics, movies, books, sex, music, commentaries, health, video games, kaiju, action, news, comedy, and opinions that would most likely get you killed in some parts of the world. We are proud to bring you some of the best podcasting in the world. Check us out at www.legionpodcast.com, iTunes, Spotify, Stitcher, YouTube, and any other dark corner of the internet where podcasts can be found.